It's, it's, it's important, I think, to notice that he allowed things to blow up in this bloody sort of way in 37 and 38, but never again. This was not something he liked. This was something that he saw as a chaotic disruption of the system. We, we have him on record, by the way, throughout the 30s leading up to the terror, publicly arguing against mass persecution and mass operations. They're messy. The trains don't run on time. They're disorganized. He doesn't like this, which, which I think shows that when it does come to that in 1937, it's not a long-term sonata that he wrote. Do you think that for all that he never said openly that 3738 was a mistake, that that is indeed what he thought? I think so, because he never did it again. And he told people in private that it had been a mistake. Uh, various people who returned from prison, uh, Yakovlev, the airplane designer, Tupolyov, by the way, an airplane designer, a couple of generals, when they got out of prison in 39 and 40 and met with him on various businesses, he said things like, well, you know, I'm really sorry what happened to you, but, you know, things kind of got messy and kind of got out of control at that point. But, but, I mean, it would be expecting a lot of him or any politician to make a huge public mea culpa. I mean, what politician does that? Did he genuinely believe that, that Yezhov was to blame for the excesses of 3738? Some of them, some of them. But notice that he never said that publicly. Right. What, the reason why Yezhov fell was not that he knew too much. Beria knew too much and never fell, after all. That didn't bother Stalin too much. What bothered Stalin a lot was a blabbermouth. Yezhov had become a drunk. Yezhov was having these drunken parties in salons in his wife's apartment where he was drinking a whole bottle of vodka and babbling state secrets to writers and directors. Uh, when Stalin decided to take Yezhov down, it was because he was a blabbermouth security risk and he took down everybody who had attended any of those parties all at the same time. Surely though, the purge of the NKVD in, in 1938 goes beyond that. Sure it does, sure it does. But that happens every time you change the leadership of the NKVD. It's built into the system of the organization. It's, it's because, and this is a whole other subject, uh, maybe for another conversation, Soviet politics under Stalin existed as a series of personal networks and clans. The head of the secret police, all of his lieutenants were his guys, and all of their lieutenants were his guys. It was like a, it was like a mafia. It was like a... Uh, uh, almost like a feudal setup. So when you change the guy at the top, the new guy inevitably removes absolutely everybody because they are the men, the clients of the old leadership. And does that help us explain not, then? Not only the police, by the way. That's the way. That's the way every bureaucracy changes to this very day in Russia. Does that explain the dimensions then of the of the terror, at least among the elite in thirty seven, thirty eight? It is about yes. the removal, not only of <coughs> the heads of these clans but their entire retinues. You can't leave the rest of the clan out there. Uh, one of the sources I've been working with lately uh, for a new project are newly available interrogation records that we have. When people were brought in by the police and interrogated, we knew a lot about this kind of vaguely from, from Arthur Kessler's work, and we know what police interrogations were like under Stalin, but now we have it word for word, a fairly substantial bunch of them. Where are these materials? Uh, a lot of them have been published by Haustoff and others. You can also find them in the party archive in, in the Yezhov Fund. There's a, a big chunk of them. What's interesting about them to me, though, again, thinking of this clan structure of Russian politics and purges, most police forces I'm aware of, when they arrest you and drag you in and begin to interrogate you and to get you to confess, they're most interested in what you did and when you did it not the Soviets, not the Stalinists. What you did, we'll tack that on later. The most important thing is who are your friends, who's your network, who you're connected with. The question they ask these poor people who are dragged in is not what, but with whom. They are trying to reconstruct personal networks and clans so they can, as Stalin said at one point, uproot them root and branch. And that's why the arrests, particularly among the elite, are so widespread. Of course, it has to start with somebody doing something, mm -hmm. and then to who knows, uh, sort of who knew whom and who was in whose clan. Right, and some of it's certainly invented, after all, 
but a lot of it's not. A lot of it's not. Uh, one of Yezhov's assistants, a man named Franovsky, he's arrested in 1938 when Yezhov falls, of course, because he was Yezhov's man. Uh, on the second day of his interrogation, at the hands of the new Beria team, who are now doing the interrogating, Franovsky says, I'd like to stop the interrogation now. Let's just save everybody the trouble. I'll write a statement. I know what you want. I know what this is all about. Proceeds to write 35 single-space pages about every personal connection he had in the police, before the police, outside the police. He basically schematicized his clan for the investigating officers. That's all they wanted. They stopped interrogating him. And they, he essentially thus signed the death warrants of a great many people with whom he was associated. That's pretty frightening. Absolutely. Frightening but it's, it's frightening, but I think it's really revealing that, that these, these Stalinists think in terms of who belongs to whom. Whose guy are you? Um, Nikolai Yezhov, uh, who I just wrote a, wrote a book about, when he was working in the party secretariat and a problem had to be solved somewhere in the bureaucracy, his first reflex was not some kind of Max Weber kind of, well, whose job, which institution is set up to do this and what's the proper agency to deal with this problem? His instinct, and it was Stalin's instinct, it was all their instincts, and he wrote, let's send some of our people over there to straighten it out. This is government for them, our people. Not your people, and not alien people, but our people. You get things done by sending trusted groups of your people to do something. Cuts across institutional lines, cuts across ministries, doesn't have anything to do with that beautiful edifice of government. It's about sending some of our team to do it. And that, that kind of thinking is what leads to this kind of arrest in The Purge. You've got to get their team. You, you are starting to talk about, and have been for some time, talking about uh, sort of, uh, the, uh, your current research is, is filtering through to your, your description of, 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 of what you did before. Let me get you to talk just to, for a short time about the Yezhov book before we talk about what you're working on uh, yeah. right now. To what extent did the Yezhov book come out of uh, simply the opening of the Yezhov fond the, in, in the, the party archive? Well, a lot were, you, uh, were you wanting to sort of explore that, that character in sort of all the preceding research? Did the book just come well, out of the... As someone who, who had worked on repression for quite a while, Yezhov is, you know, the, the tool, the instrument of the terror, the head of the secret police in the terror. He was always, you know, sort of the, I don't know, the, the chalice, the goal, the thing everybody wanted to find out about. And again, I happened to be in the right place at the right time at the party archive when his personal archive was declassified. So I dropped everything and just did that. I, I couldn't, couldn't resist it. Um, but it was the first biography that I ever written, and I'll never write another one because it's, it's too hard a thing. Writing biographies is difficult. <clears throat> um, but the interesting thing about him was not only the major question I was after, which was what kind of guy gets mixed up in something like this? How does... How does a nice little fellow like this, who had a great baritone voice and danced at parties, turn out to be a mass a murderer? That one interesting point. But another interesting point about him was that in his career, from a factory worker in 1917 all the way to the head of the secret police 20 years later, he had a lot of really interesting jobs at a lot of key places uh, during collectivization, out in the provinces, on industrialization, the party personnel office. He was in interesting places at interesting times, and that allowed me to sort of use him as a vehicle to study some interesting things. You stop short of, uh, you don't really give a great deal of depth of, about sort of the story of the, of the, of the terror in mm -hmm. the book and, and his uh, role in the terror. Is there any reason that, that you, you sought to sort of bring closure to the, to, to the book well, just as the terror there are begins? Well, there are a couple of biographies about his role in the secret police in 1936 and 1937, which go into what I think is excruciating detail about um, the huge evil deeds of, of Comrade Yezhov. It seemed kind of pointless to, to retread to over all of that. And again, to me, the more interesting question is who was he and where he came from? Um, as, I, as I suggested a, a few minutes ago, 
it's pretty easy to understand um, somebody doing horrible things. It's pretty easy to understand a killer. The newspapers are full of them. What's harder to understand is, is how he got there and what was the complex of events that shaped that. What was the structure of society and politics that, that shaped him? So where he came from, to me, was, was really more interesting than the foul things that he did. So you very much moved away from the individual to uh, the broader shape of, of Soviet politics in the 1930s again. Yeah. Can yeah. you tell us more about uh, what you're currently working on? Well, what I'm working on now is um, a project that began as a study of so-called informal relations in the Stalin bureaucracy. Uh, that is um, doing favors for people, being friends with people, uh, belonging to a clan, belonging to personal connections. Um, the sort of millions of nods and winks that, that don't get reflected in, the, in the, the table of ranks or something like that, but the kind of just peculiarly Russian ways of doing things sometimes outside official channels. Uh, it started that way, and, but that led me back to uh, an interest in clans and bureaucratic clans and the sort of rise and fall of them. Um, why is it that almost immediately after the revolution Bolsheviks coalesce into, into clans and groups and things like that? Why is it that while they're doing that they become what I think are nihilists about the whole state. They don't like states, they don't trust states. What they trust is revolutionary experience and will and personal connections. You know, it's interesting, uh, as, is, as is well known, there's the Communist Party structure and then there's the state structure, kind of two parallel structures running all through Soviet history. What's interesting to me is that, <clears throat> as we know, the state structure largely implements and carries out what the party structure decides. Bolsheviks don't like states. They are afraid of states. They spent their whole lives trying to overthrow one. Um, they always put a very powerful party politician in charge of the state apparatus. Mm -hmm. Not because it's important, but to keep it from becoming important. So then, uh, if you have to uh, explain in a nutshell what this book is going to do. Can you tell us? Well, a nutshell about a book I haven't written yet, that's a hard one. Uh, I think what it can boil down to, though, is the notion that the Bolsheviks, the Stalinists, and, but it runs all the way through to the present day, in fact. This is about personalized politics. This is about understanding government, not as a bureaucracy, but as a person. And in that sense, it goes all the way back to what Edward Keenan called the deep structures of, of, of Russian history. Government's always about a person. Whether it's a czar, whether it's a Lenin, whether it's a Stalin, whether it's a Putin. Um, I spent a couple of months digging quotations about Putin out of, out of the, the current press. And if you scratch out his name and put Stalin in there, it's the same, mm -hmm. the same kind of glorification. Um, you know, it's, some historians of, of Western Europe say, well, the king in Western Europe always had two bodies. Right? There was his physical body, and then there was his official body as, as, as a state person. The Tsar in Russia, or after that, the first secretary, only had one body. He was, he was the state. And that's led me into, into looking for all kinds of cultural artifacts that, that keep jumping up and surprising me. Um, we all know that in Soviet times, the Politburo, the leadership, stood on top of Lenin's tomb and watched the parades go by. That was not only an interesting vantage point to watch a parade. If you think about it, they're standing on his body. They're standing on his body because the body is the state. And they preserved his body not just as some kind of symbol for peasants, because that was the state. The state is about persons, personalized understandings, personal connections, and the rest of it... Um, the rest of it, I'm prepared to say, is a joke on the rubes. <laughs> Archgetty, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks.